testing. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Let me just rearrange here so that you can see it. Don't panic. There we go. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we're delighted to uh, be in Toronto um, to stage this conversation with you today in this uh, crazy cold weather. Um, we have come from different places. Meeting here has, uh, is delightful in the sense of not just meeting you, but also being able to collaborate and uh, share some ideas. Um, I want to sort of mention that for a very, very long time as I became an artist, I looked at Shishtov's work and I was uh, very admiring of it. I was a, a real fanboy and still am. Uh, it's somebody who I found uh, was a very critical and important voice in contemporary art in general, but specifically in the kind of transformation and questioning of public space and um, that, he, that he's always been doing. And I met him about 10 years ago uh, or maybe a bit longer uh, in New York City. And in Spanish, we say, uh, morderse el reboso, which means bite your poncho. So I kind of was biting my poncho, and it's like, oh, you know, Mr. Fudishko, nice to meet you. And the honest truth is I expected somebody who um, was going to be, uh, you know, quite um, striking, he was, but uh, as, as Richard said, perhaps a little bit more somber and dark, he is. But, uh, but it's also somebody who is extremely sweet. Uh, a, a, a very, very uh, beautiful friendship um, came out of that meeting. I remember asking him, you know, my name is Raphael, Lozano Hammer, and say, oh, you're the guy who writes that you make, uh, that I make site-specific work and you make relationship-specific work and you are wrong because of this and this and this and this and this. And he just destroyed me within two minutes and I quite enjoy that destruction. Um, today, um, we're going to present uh, a very specific uh, branch of work that we both have been engaged with over uh, you know, several decades. Um, we were just sitting be behind the scenes just thinking about other kinds of, of presentations that we could do, instead of trying to cover it all, we'll just focus on something that's very specific. And so the specific uh, subject that we're trying to frame is um, sort of an anthropomorphic approach, um, amplification of, of presence in public space, and a certain kind of urban puppetry. So a lot of the projects that we will show have been selected from both of our work um, to respond to some of these um, kind of frames. Of course, we could and maybe one day we will talk, for example, about mobility and uh, Shishtov's work with uh, nomadic vehicles uh, or, or my work with, um, with the urban projections on, on mobile platforms and his, or we could do it on wearables or we can do it on, on, on social practice. There's so many different intersections of our work. Um, but today, we're in the interest of time, we'll just really focus on, on this um, you know, sort of anthropomorphic approach um, to representation and self-representation in public space. So the way it's going to work is first we're going to go over a selection of Shishtov's projects along these lines. He's going to explain them to us. There's lots of videos and slides. Then I'll show some of my own. And then we'll show you what we've been working on as collaborators. We're working together. Um, we've just started, so we've got one project out, but we are thinking more and more into the future. Um, it's very important for artists to collaborate and create things together. And if you look at the history of art, that happened all the time. Artists would always get together and collaborate. And we, I feel that that's not happening as often. I feel very blessed, or, or not blessed, because I don't I don't believe in religion. I'm uh, lucky um, to to have um, to to spend time with him and, and to collaborate with him. So, uh, without further ado, um, is your microphone working? Well, I hope so. Is it working? Yes. yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Glad to hear. It. Well, thank you, Rafael, for uh, such uh, informative and generous and kind introduction. Um, <clears throat> this uh, slide is important uh, to me, not because I think it's such a great uh, project from my perspective, but it's because I have uh, a nostalgia and because it is, was the first uh, truly public projection 
uh, of course I did uh, start working on those projections in public space earlier, in fact here in Toronto, <coughs> but there were uh, exercises in public space uh, without really announcing those projections as, uh, as public. So there are something like a, uh, short attempts that I made here. One of them actually was uh, on the power, uh, on the building of, 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 of University of Toronto. Toronto, uh, the power plant, which is not far, it's a big chimney. I don't have a slide for this because I didn't really think of photographing it. <laughs> but uh, that's when my work began. It began several years before 1981, uh, and I was under great influence of uh, what was happening here in Canada, especially in the area of cultural studies. That's uh, where I became uh, connected with people who were uh, developing uh, research on this, on this topic, especially uh, Jody Berland, who is now a professor at this university. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, but at the same time, uh, I was in, from Poland, and in Poland, uh, I, I learned very much what's the relationship between human body and architecture the kind of uh, process in which people are becoming associated, in fact, identifying themselves with the institutions. They become an institution, so the whole bureaucratic, bureaucratization of their soul, or it becomes an architecturalization of their body, at the same time, bodification of architecture. So it's a projection, uh, 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 some kind of uh, double projection going on, projection identification. So in a school of architecture in Halifax when I was teaching Nova Scotia College, I started to test this ground. It looks a little bit like a surrealist uh, photo montage uh, anyway, but I'm just explaining what it was for me. Uh, so the next slide was really truly public projection. It was announced uh, uh, in newspapers. Uh, some people came, and uh, this is the very important moment. It was during the night. Uh, there was nobody there actually. Uh, I was on the, on the roof. This uh, Kodak carousel slide projector, uh, but I did hear something coming from the street. And I realized there was a group of people standing there and laughing. Laughter, that was very crucial for me. I realized that something must be to it if people laugh. Because people laugh, they don't know why they laugh. <laughs> but they also start asking themselves, why am I laughing? <laughs> so there was a beginning of thinking, as uh, Brecht would say, actually Walter Benjamin writing about Brecht, that is just the beginning of thinking, the laughter. And for me, it was beginning of thinking about possibility of continuing this kind of work encouraged by the laughter. This uh, project uh, was a little more politically uh, contextualized because it was in the national parliament in, uh, of Switzerland, in the Bund it's called Bundeshaus, uh, in the Bundesplatz. Uh, here this eye was changing its direction from the direction of uh, a Swiss uh, national bank to the city bank, which is uh, behind, and then to the, uh, to the canton bank, and then to the direction down where the whole Swiss gold is located, because the national vault is underneath of this plaza, and also to the sky, where the mountains are, the kind of Calvinist, uh, uh, very pure, pure uh, environment. So this, this was a, a slide projection. The size was changing those slides from one bank to another bank to another, to the, to the gold, and then to the sky. Was this for the first time that you were animating an image in a yes, way? Yes, this is the first time. The eyes, you're an expert on eye, uh, Raphael, and we will see some of your work. I'm sure in similar time you were thinking about the same. But I, there were video projectors didn't exist at that time. 
uh, definitely not the ones that we could project so far as the one that we are using right now, uh, produced here in, uh, in Canada, Christie uh, projector, uh, something we've been using quite a bit, uh, quite a bit uh, from Kitchener, Ontario here. This projection uh, is the, the closest, uh, because I did actually project something on uh, a few buildings here in, in, in Toronto before. But this is when I was uh, uh, already living in, in New York. I came back. Uh, this is a, a, a filtration plant. It's very hard. People don't remember that time, but there was a, a big uh, scandal because somebody pr they proposed that the water from Lake Ontario should be, uh, 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 should be sold to California when there is not enough water. So there was a big problem, of course, uh, such thing would be an environmental disaster, plus, of course, the many, many issues of pollution and so forth. So this, uh, this uh, filtration plant was uh, signing some very f dangerous document, right, with, American, uh, with Americans uh, over this dead fish and a glass of water crying. So the eyes also here were employed. Um, now this uh, projection <coughs> was uh, in Tijuana, uh, uh, which is located in uh, uh, California Norte in Mexico. Uh, and, and it was uh, done with uh, um, with people who work in maquiladora factories. That's the important thing to explain. Maquiladora factory is the one in the assembly plants that take parts from various parts of the world, assemble them, and send back to original markets. Uh, you know, many of, uh, of the equipment that we use daily is being assembled there by people, but mostly women, in fact, teenage, uh, teenage women, the girls, uh, so, but uh, here there's this El Centro Cultural, the slide that you showed at the beginning, uh, which otherwise it's called La Bola in, in Tijuana, which is a big public space where lots of events happening in front, but also inside there's IMAX theater with, uh, of course, Canadian technology as well <laughs> inside, with, uh, uh, with great shows. And that time was a show called People of the Sun, which shows uh, a glorious relationship between people of Can of, of, of United States and Mexico. as a kind of propaganda show. But in the same time, uh, serious things were happening uh, and no room for maquiladora workers in this anthropological or historical museum that is part of El Centro Cultural. So I, d I decided to uh, ask uh, those, uh, some of those maquiladora workers uh, uh, that were uh, kind of associated with the organization called Factor X, if they could speak about their experience uh, projected, projecting themselves on La Bola, using this uh, kind of, I, as now, I at that time, like this, uh, called wearable equipment. At that time, was working at MIT uh, as a part of interrogative design group. And so we designed very simple uh, kind of uh, device with camera, lights, and microphone, so people uh, could project themselves in pre-recorded fashion, but also in real time, on La Bola. Let's see it. So this, this is how it worked. Uh, we have to get some sound. It's, Can uh, we get the sound? Are you getting sound? Uh, should be more One sound. second, yeah, there's, it's at max right now, one sec. One second while we fumble with the controls. One sec, everybody. Technology. Let's just do this. Sound. Uh, sound actually is a very important problem with those projections. Uh, it's, so there's a lot of uh, uh, technology involved in projecting sound in public spaces. This projection. Uh, 
uh, was no. uh, say again Crestron, yeah. yeah okay. No, but it, so that I can control it, I had to go through Soundflower. Okay, fine. Okay. So now you have it. Okay. So what do you see? It looks a little <coughs> frightening because it's a quite a large piece of equipment, but it has a counterbalance. Okay. It's, it's one of them was being used. Another equipment was in preparation. It was a continuing process of testimonies in public space, a mixture of pre-recorded material and real time. bring the volume down to like 10%. coming out of this uh, IMAX theater and they join the crowd. So uh, the both projections were happening almost at the same time. And, uh, How many nights was this on for? Maybe four nights. She's talking to her husband, who is screaming at her and abusing her for a long time. So this, this, this slide is very important here because you could see uh, not only uh, members of the public and the person speaking, but also, very importantly, a uh, social worker without whom such project cannot exist. So without somebody between uh, the project and myself and others and those who potentially be part of it, the project cannot exist because the trust has to be built first of all, between the project and myself and the social worker. So the social worker will uh, know that it's safe to actually deal with somebody who may be just romanticizing, sensationalizing, or making money out of the misery of those people. But also the people, and those potential participants, if we can use this term, which I don't know if it's appropriate, they are also collaborators, or they are co-artists in some ways in this, this process, because they actually have to develop their trust as well. So I, had to, I was put into so many tests. I called this woman, uh, the social worker, so many times. She didn't pick up the phone. She asked me to run the meeting, and I don't know the language. Uh, so there was some translator, but she was watching it. I had to pass lots of tests, as I, she told me later, that was all specially arranged, so I can be trusted. So the idea is, of course, that those people have to choose the project. Eventually, I am showing up there, and uh, some of those people don't want this project. They have to destroy this project psychologically. Something comes from outside. Uh, then the project has to survive, and I have to come back again as if nothing happened. So then, then the other people will be there. Some of the some of the area group will not show up. There's lots of conversations behind the scene. People decide whether it makes sense. They start absorbing the project. They, once the project survives, and I go, I'm coming there a third time, so I'm still there. Once the project survives, the project can be used. 
So in that sense, psychologically and social psychology, the process is that uh, finally those people are making the project public in the, in the early stages of discussing and fig trying to figure out what should be said, what ought to be said, what made public. So the publicness of the project is born of this process. And I call this inner public. I did write something about this. I, it's not uh, time for me to deliver a lecture about the theory of the inner public, but I was get very nervous because everybody is always asking, what's the reaction of the audience? You know, how, rather than asking how much those people, like those Makilada workers, to what degree they made use of the project for their life and for the life of others who couldn't take part in this, but somehow later they, they would like to, but for many reasons they couldn't. It's not for everybody. So this person actually decided to do, uh, be part of the project because her, she put her husband to prison for incest. And the husband was about to come out from the prison and all what he was talking about is to murder her. So she decided it's much better to be public, big in La Bola, uh, make a face on the facade, uh, and be protected in a way by this. So uh, that's what she was actually talking about. So we don't have time, of course, to show this project, but I wanted to mention those things Absolutely. as an important part of this public projection. Well, those are the sketches. Uh, Raphael was kind enough to agree <laughs> that we should yeah, show them. Uh, they are just my sketches during the process of editing, when the, I could hear over and over extremely painful sometimes stories, very difficult experiences, making sketches and the focusing on technical aspects of it helps to survive in some ways this kind of a potential re-traumatization on my part, because editing, as in everybody who know, has done any editing knows how many times you have to listen to things. But at the same time, it's, it's a process of trying to fix this projection tec technically and optically, so it will really fit perfectly and we will illuminate it, uh, position of equipment will be the right place, and uh, some of the corrections have to be made. Uh, so it will be, you know, professionally, artistically, aesthetically, uh, as good as it can be. This uh, is uh, Kunstmuseum Basel, which is like an artistic center. It's actually a symbol. Uh, symbolic place in terms of superiority of, of uh, uh, Swiss cul uh, culture and art. Fantastic collection in, to which people who actually uh, are living and working in Switzerland but without documents, sans papier, they will not enter, they will not see it, they're afraid to be deported any time they show their documents or, or any, any place in even daylight, they're afraid to walk in public spaces. So uh, with the organization called Sans Papier, uh, that is working to protect or help those illegal immigrants in Switzerland, but also in other countries in, in Europe, uh, again, they had to develop trust and almost the same thing as with Tijuana. Finally, we, at night, we film uh, uh, those people, but uh, without their faces it's because of the danger of recognizing them. Even the voice was altered partially electronically, so they will be not recognized. So here they are. It should uh, yeah. work. It doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't move. The video's not running. Okay. That's weird. They were uh, reluctantly actually uh, participating in this project. <laughs> so maybe it's appropriate that they, they, show, they don't show up on the screen right now. So sorry. Okay, Something so we'll happened. have to skip this. Yeah.
But anyway, uh, the idea was that they would be speaking as if they were sitting there on the roof and uh, sharing their uh, perspective on uh, Swiss society and culture and their uh, position and uh, their hopes and their aspirations, something uh, which nobody wants to hear or usually doesn't have a possibility to hear in Switzerland. This uh, uh, projection, uh, more recent, is very different than other projections because it had really element of interactivity. Well, Raphael, you know very well that this term is being overused. It, everything is interactive. Everything. Or, in fact, only some of those projects are. Most of them are responsive at best. But in this, in this case, I really want to do something interactive. That means that uh, people uh, who came from Syria and Afghanistan, uh, new residents of, of Weimar, would speak with the public, or public could speak with them via the sculpture of uh, Goethe and Schiller. So they will become kind of new Goethe's and new Schiller's. And the public uh, could do it because the special studio, uh, uh, a monument animation studio organized inside of that theater, the theater that the image you showed us before, is the place where Weimar Republic was created. In fact, it's a very important monument itself. So what you see here is uh, uh, refugees would be inside of the theater speaking, and they will be seeing actually people uh, in a plaza. Some of them will, those members of the public, will have to step up higher to be uh, closer to the level of the sculptures. And uh, there could be a conversation. So there's a lot of feedback uh, system here. It's technologically very complex. Because those who speak through the sculpture have to see uh, interlocutors coming from the public, but also they have to see how they look uh, the, themselves in the eyes of the public. Uh, so all of this, lots of wires <laughs> and uh, complicated system. And so people would also have to think more than twice before they say anything because they have to step up you know, they're being exposed. So kind of uh, silly comments and jokes unlikely will happen. And also those refugees, and I have to also say that not only refugees were part of the project, but also those who helped them, like German teachers and those who offered their apartments. So those who offered apartments and teachers were most likely uh, they become uh, getters, because Goethe was the one who offered uh, shelter and security to Schiller. Schiller was a refugee in his time. He escaped military service, went through several checkpoints from one little kingdom or duchy to another, and under the pseudonym, worked as a doctor in Weimar. And get a, uh, so all of that is true. Of course, it's being romanticized and mystified here in Germany, but it's, it's an important story too. Uh, so why not? Uh, seeing those two, Goethe and Schiller, in a new way. Uh, well, they are new philosophers. They see the world. Uh, they see the large aspect of the world. And they also see Germany in a fresh. Of course, that was uh, a time when uh, a different time than it is today. A few years ago, it was a different situation in Germany, much more optimistic. Um, so you could see that those people will have to, it's a very primitive arrangement, but necessary to, uh, to, uh, to allow those people to become Schiller and Goethe in terms of proportion and sight. So the group of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of students, in fact, from Bauhaus University, who formed this kind of team, projection mapping team, they were using a mixture of software, like Touch Designer, for example, After Effects. Touch Designer from Canada. Yeah, I know. 
<laughs> We're doing the Canada. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was fresh from Canada, yes. Um, and uh, also uh, all that map, map, map error and so forth. And they will immediately map, so to speak, those people quickly. Uh, it took maybe a minute or two to take various parts of the body and uh, arrange it so they fit exactly uh, the, the sculptures. <laughs> so, lots of laughter and humor, humor important. It's a real meeting between uh, old residents and new residents through this sculpture, which is the most famous sculpture in Germany. There are actually copies of the sculpture in various cities. It's about, you know, a symbol of Germany. So now there is kind of expedition back to 1988 uh, because of uh, uh, we sharing here with uh, Raphael experience of working with Hirschhorn and, and both of us actually experience troubles because of disruptions. But this time uh, there was a show of art from that period, a group exhibition at Hirschhorn. So I was invited, and they asked me to reenact projection from 1988. Um, exactly the same, of course, using different technology, completely different projectors, differently arranged. In the crab on my work, they actually go back to the, exactly the same image. Uh, but the issue was that Hirschhorn Museum uh, believed that in a moment of gun violence, we should not project. Of course, I was naively thinking, you know, there would be small chance that something like this will happen, but how can I think about this? You know, I live in the United States. Every week there is some uh, gun-related violence, almost. Uh, but so just to clarify, uh, Parkland shooting happened while you were reenacting the projection? Yes. Uh, so, <clears throat> I, find, I 
was reluctant to actually agree with cancellation uh, because part of me was saying actually this may maybe the best uh, moment to do it because this kind of uh, gun-related culture should be recognized. And also uh, the meaning of this projection has changed. After so many years, I just realized there is other meanings that could be attached to this work. For example, uh, the kind of continuing process of unfinished mourning, or uh, have lost, somebody lost, some loss that be, rather than really completing the mourning, people uh, han, you know, reach the gun to try to find somebody who supposed to is responsible. It's a revenge culture. Uh, of course, wars always start this way historically. So it's a kind of continuation. So this candle, and again, I started to think about this work more and more. I think it was more and more appropriate at the same time. I work with so many war veterans on projects. After this projection, between this projection and today, so I started also to have empathy with people who might have flashbacks and difficulties to, uh, to see gun of this scale uh, in a time you know, when other things happen. So I was extremely perplexed. Uh, my colleagues, especially from the left, they say, yeah, you have to do it. Or oh, those terrible people in Hershaw, they force you to cancel it. We will do something about this. No, but people, Hirschhorn had many reasons, of course, to culture. They had nothing to do with my thinking yeah. because of their own position vis-a-vis -vis American government and their own reputation and, and public relations of all. This is their business. My perplexity was different than theirs, but still, finally, of course, uh, because of criticism that came from media that they should not be counseled, uh, not one part of that was, I guess, there was other issues that they decided to finally do this projection again. So this is a photograph, I think it looks exactly the same. But the world is different, but at the same time, they strangely similar to 1988. Because this projection uh, was done during the final weeks of the electoral campaign of old Bush, the Bush father. And he was the one who was saying, uh, uh, he had this idea of thousands of points of light to replace social programs by charities, by people with money who could be something good. Uh, so the thousand, thousand points of light was the scandal at that time in my head. He was, of course, uh, uh, you know, he was for death sentence and also, uh, you know, uh, against uh, abortion, you know, he had this this uh, was very strong military presence. So it, there is no good theory of metaphor. So I cannot really explain exactly how this kind of combination of images crossed my mind as the only thing I should do after rejecting hundreds of other possibilities. But that's how art works. But somehow it's still relevant. And that is the real problem. Those kind of work should not be relevant after so many years. Situations should be changing. So that means that we are not really, it would be naive to think that artists can really make a change this way. At the same time, it's quite possible the situation will be much worse if we didn't do what we do. So it is more of a necessity to really come up with form a metaphoric form for a complex situation. So this is the last project that uh, is not on, in public space. It's actually inside of an art gallery. 
uh, with the reproduction of famous paintings, paintings of famous people who signed the uh, Polish Constitution in 1791. It was the first European Constitution. A uh, very similar time to what was happening in the United States, actually. It's the time of uh, First Amendment, of Bill of, Bill of Rights in 1791. Uh, so that, this whole uh, enlightenment is something to do with, it's actually something to do with what government and right-wing government today in Poland is trying to oppose and question, undo enlightenment. Just about everything that is done is moving into darkness, into destroying all of the uh, hopes that enlightenment brought in terms of open education, uh, in terms of access to it, in terms of uh, all kinds of uh, egalitarian aspects of education, but also rights of people for housing and all those uh, citizenship, right, that because of the bourgeois revolution, it was all about rights given to people, to citizens, people living in the cities. So th this, those paintings, uh, uh, I, I decided to actually use the technique of projection and animation and mapping to really help those historical figures to speak with the words and faces of contemporary young activists who are uh, mostly women, in fact, who work so hard against the grain in Poland. He's the founder of Commission of Nadu National Education in 18th century, very important figure of enlightenment. <laughs> Lots of actually school groups, uh, children and high school students were coming to see this show. It was very popular <laughs> because those people, it's very hard for us here to understand how <laughs> evocative are those portraits because they are those symbols of Polish enlightenment. It's like, you know, yeah, no, uh, Jefferson, This is important. Uh, Lelevel was actually a late Enlightenment person who went through a romantic period and ended up with working with Marx and Engels in Brussels. <laughs> but he was also very important for Enlightenment in Poland. <laughs> There are very similar uh, statements that the historical figures would do, of course, with some alterations because of specific issues today, but generally, yes. Nasze ciała przestały należeć do nas. 
Nikotę się na to. Nic o nas bez nas. This is a, a major uh, kind of statements by masses of women in those big strikes in Poland. Nothing about us without us. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, well, thank you for it's, uh, it's a real, running this. It's a real <laughs> so. uh, lesson, a real delight. Um, can you uh, join me in thanking Shishtof for that incredible presentation? <laughs> I find that the more depressing the material, the more optimistic I get, because I find that uh, you know these artworks function as a kind of catharsis. Would you say that these works, when people see them, um, is your um, hope that there is a lasting impact that, in fact, is evoked by the ephemerality of these performances? Would you say that this approach of just performing and being in the now in fact, helps in retaining that memory. Yes, you know very well when the projectors like this are switched off, the end of the show, as long as the show made sense, interconnected with the context, and the context still there, the projection continues. It's a kind of after image. Mm -hmm. So that temporary work can actually last quite long. Yeah, and the disappearance is a gesture of a yeah. lot of power. Yeah. Um, I was uh, a bit, um, you know, surprised, and you're so right, that when you take an image that should have been fixed to a particular political moment and then you recreate it, um, you're creating a new context for it. And in the context of the United States today, um, those images have a different life, you know. To what extent do you feel like the artwork has a life of its own that you don't control. Like, to what extent is this elaborate productions that you put there out of your personal control? It's a risk worth taking uh, to really focus on a particular context. But the hope is, as I mentioned before, that it will not be relevant for too long, because the world should change. We should move to other problems rather than repeat old problems. Well, when it, unfortunately, that's my reflection after 50 years of my <laughs> attempts. Uh, that's um, like with xenophobia, with the situation of with, so waves of returning the same issue. And that is quite discouraging. But I am optimistic enough after all of that to still work, because I think it would be much worse, again, I'm saying the same thing, if we didn't do what we do. There's a certain inevitability to, to actually creating. Um, so what we'll do is uh, we will have more of a discussion after the presentations. Um, I want to um, just uh, jump into some of my own uh, examples from the past. As Richard said, uh, my work tends to be a little bit more playful, but I do see the playful aspect as something that's actually quite serious. Um, I believe that play has always been a fundamental part of art, including critical art. And so I'll show a wide variety of pieces, and then we will um, sort of come back and, and, uh, and talk about our work together. So. Um, just like your work in Bern, I was um, in 92. It was the um, first Gulf War, the beginning of this new kind of vision, which is uh, what Manuel de Landa in Age of, um, War in the Age of Intelligent Machines calls the executive override that computer vision had for the very first smart bombs, the bombs that would actually find their own targets. And in this particular work, which was uh, from 92, we would follow first a choreographer, a performer, and then we would open up to the public to um, show them that the eye did follow them. So it's kind of this um, direct connection with the eye. Very interested in sort of technologies of amplification and representation. 
like uh, in your work, the idea that these projectors allow a personal presence to take an urban scale. So I did a project in um, Holland um, for the Schaborg plane in, in Rotterdam, inspired by this uh, beautiful engraving from a disciple of Rembrandt who worked with the idea of perspective. And one of the things that I loved about the shadow play um, in terms of perspective is all of his larger um, the shadows were monstrous while the little ones were angelical and pure. And inspired, um, can you cut the sound for this one? Inspired by, or just leave it at 2%. Like very, very low. S super low. Okay, thank you. Um, inspired by this engraving by, by uh, von Hoogstraat, and we made an enormous uh, shadow play in uh, this Hauberg playing plaza where very powerful projectors would cast the images of peoples from, from the city of Rotterdam uh, up to 30 meters high. And then two very powerful projectors on the ground would wash out these uh, portraiture in such a way that if no one was in the square, it was just white light. But as soon as you would cross the path of the bottom projectors, your shadow would be cast. And as you would walk close to or far away from the facade, your shadow would grow from two meters all the way to 28 meters. And the idea is to create an environment that is out of control where people self-represent. And there is a moment where, as you're walking, you can actually attempt to match a shadow, uh, sorry, a portrait of one of the people in the city. Now, in Rotterdam, in Holland in general, there's a law saying that if you photograph three people at a time, you don't need to ask for their permission to use the portrait. So that's what we would do. We took uh, thousands of portraits of people in the city. Uh, it was with a team of local photographers. And then we would present them projected onto it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is only through the animation of the people that these portraits would take life. The project as a shadow is a, a very intuitive interface. Nobody tells you what to do or not to do. It's also a very generous um, kind of way to participate because you don't need to take your turn. Um, most of my own and my colleagues' projects with interactive medium public space depend on a single participant or a few participants taking, say, the sensors. And, um, and with the shadow, it's different because you can have a tableau of people participating, but your own uh, personal sort of presence is also uh, important. Technologically, we had a tracking system that detected where the shadows were, and crucially, when a shadow and a portrait would uh, overlap, the system would create a small feedback sound in public space, like tick. And then once all of the portraits in a given scene were re revealed, automatically the system would, cast, would uh, black out and produce new images. So here's these three people collaborating. The computer detects it, blacks out, cues a new image, and invites people to reorganize in the public space. So it's really not about the portraiture, it's about becoming the portraiture. And the project, um, over the three weeks that it was live, we saw incredible behaviors which would change from the time of day or the day of the week. On the weekends, you'd have lots of kids, families, and so on. This is a cinema, after all. Tuesdays was methadone night at the nearby church, so people, the addicts, would come out and prance around. A man on a wheelchair crushed everybody under his wheel, derived a lot of pleasure from this. So it was just a, a constant parade of imagery created, improvised uh, by the people in the piece. Um, technologically, we had uh, the tracking system is projected on uh, public space so that people who are interested in the mechanisms of surveillance, this kind of Brechtian noticing of the knots, was being exhibited. But most people didn't really care about the nerdy part of it. They would just sort of engage um, with each other through the, the big shadow. So you'd get this kind of ad hoc uh, experiences. <laughs> And pretty much like in the Hogstrat and engraving, it was the monstrous quality of this enormous amplification that was typically played out by people who didn't really know each other. Or sometimes by people who knew each other. Like, she abused her boyfriend for three hours. <laughs> so she's there, and she grabs him, and then she's...
So you get the idea. And we've done this project in many, many cities, uh, I think in about 12 cities around the world, and every city has a very different kind of performance that they do in public space. So this is, for example, in the city of Linz, Austria, and the Hauplatz, um, and other places. Another uh, sort of portraiture project is this one that we, um, the last version of it, we did it at Trafalgar Square in London. It's, again, thousands of volunteers from the city who are recorded by um, filmmakers, local filmmakers. And in this particular case, when you find a portrait, the portrait finds you. So it's basically a shadow play where um, there are people that you find inside of your shadow who match it, and you basically, with your presence, wake them up, and they establish eye contact. So this is a motorized system. It's a motorized system with, with robotic projectors. Mm -hmm. And um, when they're looking at you, they just stay there, kind of not, not really like a loop, but we call it scrubbing the playhead. So they're constantly suspended, just making eye contact with you. And then, of course, when you're not interested in, in the portrait, you can just uh, walk away. And as you walk away, the portrait knows this and goes back to sleep and disappears, never to appear in the same location. So this is a projection over a large area. It's inspired by the work of Adolfo Bioy Casares. If you ever read Morel's Invention, it's a beautiful novel about a post-photographic presence of people from the past that are recordings. Um, it's uh, from 1941, it's beautiful. Technologically, it's these robotic projectors that uh, Shishtof was mentioning. The world's lar largest projection, I always say that my work is as big as my insecurity, so I get the biggest projector in the world. But now I go to psychotherapy, so I do little things. That's the end of that joke. Um, the tracking system is uh, pretty ominous. It not only detects where you are, but predicts where you will be in the future. So you see that little green crosshair? It's uh, sort of estimating where in your trajectory you will be in the future. And we use that information because the robotic projectors um, want to put a portrait in your path so that you go to the portraits, the portraits don't go to you. And most people don't care how it's done, but technologically it's quite complex because we're deforming and we're scaling and we are, um, you know, sort of uh, translating the, the image so that it fits perfectly in people's shadows. Um, in terms of this is the, the thousand portraits shot, we asked people to do whatever they wanted. The only thing we asked them is at one point look straight at the camera, and that's the moment that we triggered when uh, you discover the image. So most people, um, you know, they just say hi, or some people did sign language, uh, some people dance or, you know, take off their clothes. In England, I find people like to take off their clothes a lot. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we would sort of project this. And then sometimes the people who got recorded, the guy with the Yukon t-shirt, um, so some people would find themselves in their, in their shadow. And that was straight out of David Lynch. So this is uh, under scan. Um, I'll skip this project. So in 2015, the Mexican government was criminally the culprit of a kidnapping of 43 students in Ayotzinapa, in Iguala, in Guerrero. And in this particular artwork, when we heard that the 43 students were not found, that there was no forensic evidence that they were dead, the entire community is still looking for these kids that were 17 to 21-year-old education students. So when I heard that in Montreal, I thought we work routinely in my studio with face recognition, face detection systems that are used by police or military to look for uh, faces. And we trained the system with the faces of the Ayotzinapa. Napa 43. So when you stand in front of it, the system um, measures your facial features and it compares you to the database of all 43 students. The idea is that at the end of that analysis, the system finds who you look like the most. And it says, yeah, you look like uh, Martin Getsemani Garcia, but our level of confidence that you are Martin is only 23%. Result, student not found.
The idea with this project is not really an artwork as much as it is just a platform that is meant to be viral. The software can be downloaded for free from my website, and it can be installed, and it has been installed in almost 100 universities, uh, libraries, galleries, foundations, all across Mexico, but also around the world. Because the idea is that the project is about empathy, about not seeing these kids as people who are just in the news, but they are part of us. There's a fraternal connection. There is a a similitude to, to yourself, and this idea that um, you may be next. The project also has um, generated some income, so whenever we exhibit it, we've generated some money, and then we've sent the entire proceeds to the families of the disappeared in Iguala for their own forensic evidence and their lawyers and so on. And one final thing that applies to Canada, when I made this project, um, I was interviewed by the CBC and they said to me, well, as a Mexican artist, you know, living in Canada, you know, the situation is that Mexico is very dire, it's a very dark moment. And I said, yeah, it's very dire, you're right. But now in Montreal, we are um, working with indigenous programmers to make a version of this project not to look for the 43 students of Ayotzinapa, but to look for the over 1,000 indigenous women that have been lost for the past 10 years and nobody knows where they are. So the idea is that this, the source code is free, it can be downloaded from our GitHub, and anybody could recode to do their own search for um, in the Universidad de Tierra del Fuego in Argentina, they're looking for the over 10,000 disappear from the dictatorship. So this is level of confidence and is this idea that we must invert the mechanisms of surveillance instead of looking for the culprits, we know where they are, they're in power, look for, in this case, the victims. I'll skip that one. Um, so a lot of what I do in public space are large projections. Um, oftentimes, um, these large projections have to do with amplifying um, participants that are locally present at the plaza. Um, I've been now making a lot more permanent installations with runs counter to the first 20 years of my career when I uh, admired very much the ephemerality, not just of the work of Shishtof, but people like Johann Gertz. If you guys ever saw his work, the, the Hamburg uh, Holocaust Memorial, which is basically a big monolith that goes in and disappears into the earth. If you visit the memorial, all you see is the footprint of this phallic thing that is now on underneath the idea that disappearance is uh, you know a fundamental way to to remember um, and uh, and but anyway, so I'm going counter to that. I'm now making a lot of permanent work um, in this particular case, I was given this building uh, by a developer in Mexico City that really likes art and he said, Rafael, I want you to create a media facade in here, something that you know everybody will uh, remember as iconic. I want you to create a big landmark. And I have a problem with architainment, this idea that there's color changer luminaires that are you know, sort of in all over the world, you're seeing magenta turn into emerald green and then that into Congo blue. And I just, it boils my blood that people do that with color. I hate it so much, in part because I have a lot of respect for color and I've read Joseph Albers, I think more of these lighting designers should read it. So color changing lights are, uh, a vermin on our urban space, and we must absolutely ensure that we are very you know, strategic on how we use LEDs um, to create something that, that is a contribution. So this is what I was given, um, and what I decided to do is I, I'm putting LEDs on the mullions of this building, and, uh, and creating what I think is, is, this is gonna be later this year, is a memorable artwork. So here you are, this is what's gonna be. So we're gonna have this uh, small keyhole at the entrance of the atrium and you can look into this keyhole and as, as you look in, of course, your eyeball is being scanned. And then that uh, collection of eyeballs uh, that have looked into the building then become the texture of the building itself. And I think if you work in this building, you know, and they ask you, where do you work? You say, well, I, I work in the I building. You can't miss it. Like, I really think that at least the, the call for it to be a memorable landmark uh, will, will happen. But I really believe in this kind of more perverse, uh, slightly, um, you know, um, gross imagery. I do a lot of, a lot of that now. 
Um, and then um, I'll end, no, I have two more projects. Uh, one of them is, this is a mask um, that is the mortuary mask of Mexican poet called El Nigromante. He is, for us atheists, it's kind of like our patron saint. So he said, God does not exist, natural beings, uh, develop uh, according to their own means. And he said this 20 years before Darwin and 60 years before Nietzsche. And among the things that this poet did is he became part of the government that expropriated the churches and converted them into public schools. He authored the first uh, textbooks. Uh, he advocated for women to vote. He was a real incredibly important revolutionary guy. And the family gave um, uh, my friend Jesus Rodriguez and I this mask to do something with it. And so you go now into San Miguel de Allende. Uh, can I have volume, please? So you go now into San Miguel de Allende, Guanajuato, which is where he was born, and this is his, his home, and you go and visit the mortuary mask of El Nigromante. And every person that walks to see the Nigromante gets a different session, a different experience. So working with um, dramaturg Jesus Rodriguez and actor uh, Damian Alcázar, He's in Narcos, he's a really great um, actor. You come in and you see the mask. And like in Shishtov's work, the mask wakes up. He just said, dead people don't speak. Uh, dead people can also be killed. And then he asks. Are you scared of death in general or your own death? And then when he asks that question, it maps my own face onto the mask. then your face disappears. So there's about 300 different statements and questions that the mask can ask, and it's like a different um, phantasmagoria for each person that goes in. He asks you, are you corrupt, or things like that. The family of Nigromante uh, has a sense of humor, thank God. Um, this is a fountain that uh, does face recognition and creates your likeness out of cold water vapor for a brief instant. It's, um, pareidolia is the, capa the capability of our perceptual system to see faces in clouds and toast and It was shown in anuses. Montreal. This in one? Montreal, no. You saw this one? No, it's only been shown in New York no. so far. Or oh, in Korea, too. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like a well, you look down at it, and for a brief instance, the, um, the smoke uh, you know, performs your likeness like a little narcissist thing. And, um, Fantastic. and it's kind of this ephemeral image that appears. And you have a collection of everybody who looked at it before, so all the different faces. Um, so I'll skip this project. Okay, S which brings us to um, the first collaboration that Shishtof and I did was in 2015. If we could bring the volume to zero, please. Um, in 2015 at the Moac Museum, we got an opportunity to show a work which originally was planned for the Beijing Architecture Biennial. Uh, it's a work called Zoom Pavilion, and in it we have a number of tracking systems um, that do everything from face recognition to, um, you know, structured light and, uh, and tracking of relationships of people. Um, it is inspired, um, can I say what it's inspired by? So when I met Krzysztof, he was telling me that in Poland, um, as a young uh, person in, uh, in communist Poland, uh, it was illegal for um, three people to meet in public space because it was seen as a, as a protest, I guess, or as a no, suspicious. Illegal gathering. Illegal gathering. 
And so what this work does is it doesn't only track you individually, it tracks you in relationship to everybody else who has been in the room. So it tells you how long you've spent close to uh, somebody else, um, at what distance, how you moved around the space, and it keeps that in an ominous archive that is in the back. And the project is exactly at the boundary between um, the violence of tracking and predatory vision and this kind of policing of the public, and we're complicit with this kind of denunciation of this technology. The, the complicit, complicity, complicity. Is, is very <coughs> big issue here because, in fact, people hate surveillance, yeah. but also they love surveillance. Right. So the, it, it, those two things came out of, in terms of how people play with this installation. They really, uh, they will feel abandoned if they were not under surveillance. If they were not. <laughs> so there was some kind of uh, an easy playfulness going on. And I, mean, I was going to say, it's like between the violence and then the seduction of participation yeah. of the idea of being counted or reality TV, the selfie, and there is this kind of uneasy tension between those, those reproductions yes. of, of ourself. Yeah. Zoom Pavilion was uh, not premiered in Beijing because two weeks before um, they had technical problems, um, so more like they didn't really want the project, I guess. But in Mexico, we could do it. Uh, Jesus Rodriguez says that in Mexico, there is no censorship until you get killed. So we, we managed to do the project. Well, in, in Beijing, there is censorship before. There is a reason for it. Right. So <clears throat> I, th I assume that some of those uh, people who were working in this large system of, the, of that Biennale, they were afraid that somebody will come and see this work and comment it, interpret it, especially foreign uh, journalists, as some kind of metaphor of, uh, of the society under surveillance. Which, of course, in, it was. In China. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> well, it's in general. I mean, surveillance was, at my position. It, it's more general, but they will take it as very specific. To them. Yeah. yeah. And then. Uh, I'll stop the, the, the presentation with a question of what's next. Uh, so Shustov and I are preparing a number of artworks, but I just want to share you one slide of what's next for us. <laughs> so that's what's next. And uh, I thank you very much, Richard and, uh, and Daniels, for uh, the faculty for bringing us. Um, it's a real delight, and now we will open it to questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your work. Fantastic. So, hi everybody. It's hot in here, though, or is it just me? Menopause. Yeah, there's a question there, or somebody taking a photo. Yeah, there's somebody right here. Hi. Here's a mic coming. Hi there. Um, I have looked at both of your works previously and I find them really interesting. And what I wonder is, do you wish sometimes you, any, any of your artwork would stay uh, forever? Like, Permanently, on a building, or I could, I could. any artwork if you want, that you if, would like if, to. If you would like to see one of your works permanently installed, so that it's always oh. there. I don't mind permanent work as long as it's changing. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, I think your last slide gave me my answer, but I just, especially if you are intending some permanent things, we have a lot of discussion about monuments that um, represent histories that aren't representative, and would it be fun to do something relatively permanent on, you know, the Ryerson statue, or one of the statues of John McDonald, or John Robert in the United States? 
I, 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 so so I, I really like his answer about permanence. So long as it's changing, then this is good. My, my own version of that is I, I think of my works not in terms of preservation, but perpetration of the cultural act. So so long as these artworks can continue being active and, uh, and dialogical, then I think that that's uh, an OK outcome. I, I do think that many artworks need to have an honorable death. Um, and uh, I think that there is a vampirism, a, a vampirism and a necrophilia associated, especially with art collections, which is very subs, uh, sub, uh, suspect. Um, on the subject of being able to um, reinterpret or somehow um, question or interrogate some of the um, monuments that, uh, that are existing that are, that are problematic. I, I remember Brecht's quote about, um, he said, Brecht said that Great Rome was filled with arches of triumph. Who built them? Over whom did the Caesars triumph? So, so long as an artwork can activate those questions over the erasures and the, ex, uh, you know, sort of extractions uh, of minor histories from those um, representations, I think that the artworks, sorry, the, the monuments um, should in fact probably, in, in, if I were asked what to do with all of these pieces, I would do what they did in Hungary, where they put all of the monuments in a single park where you can visit all of these large, you know, sort of communist uh, sculptures and then have contemporary historians and, and, uh, and artists reinterpret these, these sculptures. I don't believe that they should be destroyed. Yeah, they, sh they, <clears throat> they should all together be receiving some lectures. Right. So there should be lectures given to those monuments. Nice. So they will learn something, <laughs> uh, what they really mean. School for monuments. To us, yes. <laughs> the universities, not to call it re-education, like in this kind of uh, Chinese. Uh, but I, I like that much better than the Hungarians, because the Hungarians yeah. made a museum of these, mm -hmm. you know, sort of sculptures. But it's much better to send them to school. Yes. Thank you very much for an incredible overview, and which only touched very, I know your work, I very touched a little of it. But I have a question, um, what I was really struck by was this question of how context shift and then readings of work shift. And I'm just wondering about the ethical questions you would have as artists as these contexts continue to shift. And particularly, I was struck by some of the interactive works where the shadows wake up, or people play with hitting people, and as we move into um, a world where there's a lot more violence, and there's a lot more violence displayed within social media, is there a moment would come when you saw a public actually interacting with such a degree of violence with the shadows or with the shadow plays that you would think, what do I do with this work now? Um. Yes, yes, that's an ongoing thing. But it is a fundamental part of what I believe that I should, to an extent, uh, allow for this to be an experiment whose outcome is unknown. So when I first started working with the shadow, I thought that the shadow was this kind of more now expressionistic fear of otherness, the subconscious, this kind of monstrosity that Hawk Stratton has. And yet what you do see is people having a much more, um, you know, uh, playful uh, approach to, to the uh, shadows. Um, I have to admit that I selected images that were a little bit more violent because I wanted to uh, connect it back to the Hulk Stratton uh, engraving and show that the amplification was a monstrous tool. So it, you do see the full, you know, sort of range or spectrum of, of behaviors. Um, Let's put it another way, uh, not on shadows, but on a microphone. So I've made many, many works where there is a freedom of speech. There is a, I don't know if they resolved this problem yet here, but uh, there is a piece here um, at Ryerson, I think, or somewhere. It's m made by Realities United. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? The censored piece of art that you guys bought for a million dollars, and then it's been 
turned off because the transport authorities does not want to create a platform that allows people to speak freely because they're afraid that people will say offensive things. I cannot be more perplexed and depressed by such a decision. It's a decision that assumes a paternalistic and condescending attitude toward the public, assuming that somehow curtailing certain words from being expressed <laughs> through that platform merited the silencing of the piece altogether, which is what happened. So it's, it, it, has, to work, it has to work in a way that you create a platform that invites people to lift the level. So when I've done pieces I've nev uh, with voice, I have never censored them, but I have seeded them with curated content that lift the dialogue up. So on the subject of if I ever um, would see that these uh, images would turn somehow violent, I would certainly react to that. But it is a default state that people should do whatever the hell they want. But the reaction is it's not only interaction between the person and, for example, the shadow or somebody inside of the shadow of the person. There's also a reaction of other people yeah. who are seeing those re uh, relations. So therefore, uh, it's very, I mean, the, the situation becomes self-motivated, uh, self uh, generate, generated on the larger social level because it's public space. Yeah. Uh, so it's very hard to capture this in your uh, video, but uh, yeah, and and it comes from this desire. I was mentioning the the they mentioned the Morel. It comes from this desire of there's this idea that politicians, for instance, have that the safety of a city, for example, against terrorism, is to put surveillance cameras everywhere. And anybody with some common sense knows that the solution to terrorism, for instance, is not technological. The solution is cultural. The solution is translation, diplomacy, redistribution of, of means, uh, addressing colonial issues, and so on and so forth. We all know it's complex. It's not a camera that is going to make you safer. So there is that question of what would happen if we would take every single surveillance camera on public space and we'd convert it into a projector. And the, que the, the theory is that if we were given images, if these images were there to be shared, uh, perhaps encounters, social encounters mm -hmm. and relationships might emerge that would make us safer. I know it's completely utopian and, and ridiculous, but that is, you know, what, what I say to myself. Um, thank you, Raphael Stop, for uh, presenting. I was wondering if you could kind of maybe continue that conversation on utopia or not, or a, a work needs to have a good death. In regards to your own <clears throat> kind of privacy policies, um, it's one thing to kind of, I guess, expose people to, you know, the spectacle of uh, surveillance. Um, and of course, as you pointed out, they're very complicit, as they are in data collection and so forth and social media already and having fun. So I'm wondering, do, is there, do you have like a privacy policy for the studio? And I guess now that you're collaborating, either of you want to answer this? that's publicly available either at the space where people are participating and their images and their biometric data is being collected? Um, or do you take consent that they just walk into public space um, without necessarily knowing as a certain consent, like you know, sign the terms of agreement that everyone just clicks and doesn't really read anyway? So yeah. I was wondering if you could maybe address that um, and what the afterlife of these yeah. uh, personal images are that you're collecting. It's okay if I... Okay, so, um, so for example, the show that I have right now at the Hair Short, uh, which is shut down, thanks to Trump, um, has three installations that collect your heartbeats and your fingerprints. There's this biometrics that it accumulates. So two things. One is uh, there is not really a policy on privacy uh, that's per se like a nice document, but it does tell you entering this, art, the, entering this exhibition, you will be uh, exposed to these kinds of surveillance technologies. Um, your content will become part of the piece itself and entering this space is um, an understanding that this is what is happening. So there's an acknowledgement per se that is at the very entrance. But the second more important issue is that every single data collection point that we have at the studio is actually always recycled by new memories. So for instance, um, the eyepiece that you just saw with the texture on the facade, 
Um, after uh, 21 people participate, your own eye disappears from the, uh, from the archive. So I think of a lot of the data collection that we do in my projects as memento moris, right? Like the fact that, you know, as people participate, any new record erases an old one, keeps us, keeps us in the now, which is what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in amassing big data. I'm interested in in having that sense of sharing uh, a particular biometric with a group of people, knowing that it's going to be there only temporarily. But it is an act of faith of people that they enter into it, much like we have an act of faith going with every single social media platform or entering into a shopping mall, which has a code of conduct that you know has been pre-established before us. So it's kind of this attitude of, not that it doesn't matter, of course it matters greatly, but, um, but just to sort of highlight that, um, that in this particular case, the idea is just the, the change, you know. So instead of the permanence, is this is constantly changing. That's how I've sort of thought, you know, to resolve that issue. Hey, um, just uh, wondering about the funding. If you go to a different city, like if you have to transport all of this equipment, uh, does every city pay for your artwork to show? Is it? Your own money? Is it private money? Who funds most of your projects you for both? Thank you. Hmm. I guess it's there's something similar and something different between the way mm -hmm. we operate, right? Because yep. <clears throat> I don't really have uh, a permanent team or technological base to experiment and develop things as much as you do. Mm -hmm. uh, but <clears throat> in my case, I just the teams are created in the place where the project uh, is going to be developed. So, though, uh, the, for me, it's very crucial to um, to to have a support that's coming from uh, artistic, cultural agencies, uh, organizations that will. Uh, like me to do something in this particular uh, context in which they operate. So um, it's not that I'm uh, running around and proposing myself like uh, Leonardo da Vinci who will be sent those uh, self-promotional letters everywhere. Uh, just uh, somehow I'm counting on some generous interest. Um, but. It benefit from this is that the teams are formed from this area. So there is certain intelligence and knowledge that uh, uh, everybody adds to the project. I learn a lot from those people. Uh, I don't know how it works exactly in your case. So in my case, um, so in your case, it's mostly commissions from biennials or whatever that give you an opportunity to develop a piece for them. Right. In my case, that's about 50% of our practice. The other 50% is actually through um, galleries and uh, through market sales. So uh, like I said before, um, I was, uh, um, uh, I, I hated uh, all the market. I've always thought that it's speculation and ostentation um, until I started working with galleries and they started selling some of these works and I could see that the works could have a life of their own in collections, which some of which I, I, I do admire. And that became an income stream for the, for the team. So, so it's public and private. There's both of those. There's a new income stream that we've added at the studio. So my studio runs basically like a performing arts organization. I'm the director, but we have programmers, we have researchers, we have photographers, architects, and so on. Uh, we're 15 people in Montreal, and, uh, and it's costly. We need to generate income to, to pay the, the bills. And so I, I'm getting better at writing budgets and being able to be very passionate about the uselessness of my projects. And, uh, and, and one income stream that we've just invented, or we didn't invent, but we, we just adopted, is the fact that m most of my work require a certain maintenance over time. So we have now uh, monetized the support of my own projects. So I've totally Microsofted my own studio. And uh, if you acquire a work of ours, and then over time you need support, we have maintenance contracts that allow that project to have a life after. And so long as you tell the collector 
collector that they will need to spend this money into the future, they're happy to know that there will be somebody there to pay. So if you're if there's artists here, I really recommend that you do what we're doing at the studio, which is offer a warranty of zero years. That's, that's how much warranty you should give. And then you should explain how much you charge as a day rate to support your own project into the future and make money. But your situation is advantageous from my point of view because you could generate new projects. You have enough potential to actually experiment or exer make exercises, you know, even experimentations, uh, to really unfinish things and move on yeah. before there is any interest, you know, and possibility coming from outside. Once that interest come, doesn't come with the kind of generosity uh, that will support longer experiment, right. you know, or development. So in that sense. Uh, Yes, I, I would like to have a situation that you created for yourself, uh, but, well, maybe together. Together, that's, that's how we're doing <laughs> we it. We combine our <laughs> different approaches. But I have one. to say also, I, I look at um, Ashishtof's practice, and one of the things that is really, you know, for me, a, a very important sort of teachable moment is the degree to which Shishtof does research into the communities that he works with, the degree to which there is a sense of, of dialogue and how these pieces emerge, not just like UFOs that land, but it's something that I've always deeply admired, you know, your capability to engage the communities and to what you said in the very first project about Tijuana, they choose the project. And, and I think that that's a really astute way of of ensuring that your work can be um, mm. a, a public takeover of public space. Well, I, I wish I could offer something more interesting technologically no, 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 <laughs> as, as, as much as you do. No. So, oh, we'll see. Future is still in front of us. It's, yes, that's right. Hi. Um, my name is Patricia Davila. I've um, admired your work for many years, both of you. Um, and. Forgive me for stating the obvious, but um, in the works that you've presented here, I noted a, a marked difference in terms of um, the playfulness, uh, the, a certain level of ambiguity in the work of Rafael, uh, and it allowed, um, in my view, a certain uh, freedom to restage the work in a lot of different areas, uh, different places, and then with Tishkov, uh, your work is very um, site-specific, um, less ambiguous in my view, uh, more <coughs> on the nose with a, a political um, intent and accessible in that way. And I'm wondering um, how you both navigate, if this is true, if you agree with that sort of assessment, um, how you navigate those two tendencies when you collaborate couldn't understand fully the question. Uh, it's, complicated. It's, a, it's a good question. It's really good. <laughs> it's just trouble. It's could. trouble. Um, yeah. so, so he's asking whether, you know, it, there's, there is very distinct sort of continents in both of our works. And the question is, when we collaborate, how do we negotiate things like the fact that I try and keep things ambiguous and improvised and, um, and interactive, whereas there is a, a, a very sort of careful curation in your part, sometimes very politically uh, engaged message that you're trying to, to evoke. Hmm. Well, this is really a risk worth taking, you know, <laughs> because <clears throat> I really admire some aspects of your work. You like some methodology of my work. Uh, so I think that the, uh, the, the polit political aspects and phenomenological aspects, of course, they should be able to work together. Uh, in fact, my own uh, uh, Canadian upbringing, I should complete this, it's not only cultural studies, as I mentioned, uh, but also connected with this uh, uh, activist work, 
uh, in Toronto, especially the work of Lisa Steele and Insight uh, a magazine and, and also Kim Tomchak and Clive Robertson. So we have uh, somehow I, I learned how to try to combine those worlds of, of uh, what I call phenomenological approach, meaning body, technology, uh, architecture, uh, and humans, with uh, critical work that responds to uh, urgent issues that must be addressed. So I, I, I really think it's, um, I'm kind of equipped to absorb some of your approach and, 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 and I think vice versa vice because versa. some of your projects is a, a very much activist as well and very straightforward mm -hmm. like one for example in, in Mexico City, yeah. right? So do we have those two sides. Yeah. Maybe different proportion. And I, and I have to say that I've is. collaborated, for example, with composers, with architects, with writers, linguists, and so on. And the most difficult collaboration, of course, is with another visual artist because you, you, know, you tend to know exactly what you want. And I've found it really useful to kind of have dialogues about the fundamentals of what it is that I'm trying yeah. to do and contribute. Yeah, I think the Zoom pavilion is definitely more learn from your experience than from mine, but the next time... We'll do we'll yours. Be, uh, <laughs> we'll figure it out somehow. Of course, it might fail, but it's, I say, risk worth taking. We'll take one more question. You, he's, he's patiently waited over here in the front. You haven't seen him. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I was curious about, um, there's a lot of interactive art being made today, art that has become sort of adopted by advertising and you're seeing it more in public spaces used for, you know, those kinds of, for those kinds of reasons. And um, a lot of both of your work like relies on uh, it's, it impresses in terms of its scale or the novelty of its technology, its use. And so do you feel that there's a, but, you know, but then your work goes deeper than that. I feel like a lot of your work um, impresses, gives you that initial wow, but then there's something there underneath for people to explore and reflect on. Do you worry at all that there's so much commercial work being made now where that magic, the like projection mapping and uh, interactive mm -hmm. work that people are becoming sort of used to this technology. Um, and is that a challenge for you as an artist to stay ahead of, of that? Can I answer? Um, so no, it's not a challenge because um, there is this position that, that I think we all should have, which is that technology is not new and is not optional and it is not a tool. It is a language of globalization and working with technology is just trying to study ourselves. Everybody, even if you don't have a technological tool, you are living in a technological culture, the whole McLuhan thing. So um, there is this position of technological correctness, the idea that somehow the novelty of a particular approach will be the seduction that will, for instance, sell alcohol. Um, both, we were just comparing notes before uh, coming out about which projects we have turned down that are corporate, corp you know, advertising projects. We've both turned down Absolute Vodka and we're like excited about like, you know, sort of comparing notes. It's like, who have you turned down? Because ultimately the, the reality is that working in public space is to establish a relationship of trust. And the moment that you have like a branding or any kind of subliminal thing, it backfires on the artist, but also on the company. So there is, I, I believe, a place for corporations to collaborate um, with us, not, not in an advertising, but for them to give us money uh, or give me money. I don't, I don't want to speak for Shishtov. I say that I work with corp corporations so long as they do exactly what I tell them. Um, and it's a pompous and privileged thing to be able to say something like that, but I do believe as you get older, you have to be very selective and ensure that you're uh, not working for Nestle, Pepsi, Lockheed Martin, Porsche. I mean, there's a lot of 
brands that you drop only because you need to you know maintain a certain degree of um, of what of coherence yeah. or I would like to uh, t take it from different angle uh, <clears throat> and maybe it's a little bit of academic way for me to approach it, because there's 100th anniversary of Bauhaus uh, coming in April 20th. Uh, and Oskar Schlemmer, who's a very important person, a great reference to many artists, including myself, he said that uh, the new technologies, the whole world of, uh, of objects and uh, gadgets and all that, actually is a marvelous world that actually creates an illusion uh, of uh, artistic quality. And see, but in reality, this is just a, a potential from which you should do something, uh, something new, something really meaningful. So he, 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 100 years ago, uh, there was a full consciousness of this. After the First World War, when, uh, when Schlemmer was working, there was so much technology. You know, in fact, the whole Bauhaus was very much into technology, and yet he would say that's just a potential. So uh, I, I think, I think and, this and is their a work, And their work is timeless. We think about it yeah. as a contribution, not just by the novelty, but also by, by form yeah. and by impact. Um, but I don't think that there is a solution to that. I think there's a lot of porosity. And I do find that just in the same way as um, media gets adopted by um, corporate interests, um, it happens the other way around, too. So an artist is and can be inspired and pervert some of that, um, you know, sort of advertising or whatever. There's huge traditions of artists doing that kind of perversion um, that, that I think is very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.